Uh, welcome to Talks at Google. I'm Mark Deschweinitz. I'm here with Tony Hawk, Ryan McAnochi, and Adam Wilson, uh, all part of the new DECAL Creative Brand Consultancy Agency. How would you describe that, DECAL? Let's start with that. That, that was pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you nailed it, Mark. Oh. <laughs> I mean, we're, 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 still, we're still trying to figure it out. We, we don't like to use the word agency, but that's how people know companies that do what we do. Um, I guess our, if there's a tagline, it would be, you know, we're not here to make ads, we're here to make brands happen. Um, that's kind of our, our jam. And maybe we'll, maybe we'll weave a little bit of that into this discussion, because there is a lot of overlap. Yeah, cool. Um, so today we're going to talk about skateboarding, marketing, creativity. Um, first, let's talk a little bit about skateboarding. Tony, you've done a ton of interviews on skateboarding. Um, how would you relate your experience skateboarding to marketing and creativity, like as a general sense? Well, I think skateboarding at its core is highly creative. I think that if to be a skater, you've got to sort of figure out how to make it your art form. You know, it's not just a sport of who's fastest, who, go, who jumps the highest. It's more like, what can you do with this? What kind of style do you have? And um, I fell in love with it at an early age, and I fell in love with all the characters too, because it was just this very unique crew from all walks of life, and they listened to punk music, and they had weird hair, and, and I've, I loved it, you know? And, and then suddenly my classmates thought I was a freak, like within the first year that I was doing it. Right. Did, um, did that put any pressure on you to do something else? Like, were you awkward as a younger uh, Absolutely. Person? I was, yeah, I was a super skinny, small, nerdy kid and found skateboarding. And then all of a sudden I was hanging out with what, you know, what I thought was much older guys, like 18 and 20. And, um, and they were all, had this really cool style and, and just went against the grain. And I think that's what I learned at the time, especially it was just like, yeah, just do your own thing. And, and and be proud of it and enjoy it, even if it doesn't fit in with mainstream. And um, I mean, it's, it's hard to quantify because people don't understand how truly uncool skateboarding was in the early 80s. Like if you did it, you were instantly marked as an outcast. Um, I got picked on a lot, which we now know as bullying. Um, and, uh, and it was just, it was a time when if you did it, you were part of this very we, we like to think, consider it elite, but it was just this strange outcast group. And for the most part, you were just made fun of because you did it. What do you think when you look at skateboarding today and it's much more mainstream and we have sponsored competitions like versus when you were a child? I think it's awesome. I would, I would have killed to have people pay <laughs> me back then, you know, and, and to uh, have those opportunities. Um, I think it's great. I think it, it just shows how far we've come and, and that skateboarding and skaters themselves stayed the course. Like they, they, they kept doing what they loved. They, they refined this activity into something that does translate to a bigger audience um, and really hits the mark for kids who have short attention spans, um, like daredevil activities, like something that is still kind of against the grain. And um, I, 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 I love to see, I love the fact that I get to see skateboarding come of age like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, when you were skating when you were young, did it ever help you feel like this was an escape from any of the other pressures of life? Like what really brought you into that zone or that flow of skating? Um, it was the idea that you could, you could always be learning something new. Um, it wasn't really, I, 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 escape, I don't know. I don't think of it as an escape. Uh, you know, I didn't really have the pressures of family or mortgage when I was 12, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think it was more that I, I really enjoyed that it was this, this other thing that gave me an identity and you could do it in your own style. That's what I loved about it. It was like I, I was skinny and, and my style was different than, say, the sort of Dogtown era um, flow. But at some point, I think it was, it was when I learned my first trick that I knew no one else had done. And, and that sounds like an awesome thing. It really was just me going halfway up a bowl and turning my board around. And it was like, oh, cool, no one's done that. No one cared. Um, <laughs> but for me, it, was, it really gave me a sense of self-confidence. Mm -hmm. And I think that carried me through, because it was, it was suddenly, it was like, this is just a blank canvas, the skateboarding thing. You can do anything. 
You can, can you talk to us more about what it's the process of creating <coughs> tricks? Like, do you start with something known and then incrementally tweak it, or what do you? It's do always there? different. Um, it's it's more. A lot of times, a mistake will be a beautiful accident, and then you think, "Whoa, what if I actually did that, or I turned my board this way?" And um, sometimes it's just more obvious. Like if you're spinning, like what's the next 180 degrees? What's the next spin? Or can we maneuver? Can you maneuver your skateboard? while doing that same spin. Mm -hmm. um, and nowadays, with the, with the advent of, of street skating and, and skaters being so technical, it's, it's, like, it's literally like video games. Because it's like, oh, you do this crazy flip trick into a grind and flip it out and spin around and go down the stairs. And I mean, all that <laughs> stuff we were doing as a joke in our video games 15 years ago. Do you think your video games have influenced new skate trips? Skate tricks, um, yeah. I, I think so on a, on a very general scale, but I think more so that, that kids grew up like playing our video game series and thinking that was possible. Like they, they had no idea that we were just doing these fantastical moves and, and doing it because we love doing it in a video game because it's not real. And then kids grew up doing that thinking that's real and, and then they pursued it. Can you tell us a little bit more about creating the Tony Hawk video games? What, what was that like for you? How did the opportunity come? Uh, it was, um, well, there's a, a long version of it, but the short version is that Activision called me because they knew I was interested in doing a game because I had actually pitched a game to other uh, console manufacturers and, and software developers. And they said, well, we heard you want to do a game. We are doing a game, and we'd love to have your input on it. And so I went to Activision, and they presented me with a PlayStation. And there was um, Bruce Willis on a skateboard, <clears throat> because they had just done a, a game called Apocalypse, starring Bruce Willis. I think it was one of the first games that ever had a celebrity in it. Um, and they said, we made this game, but the engine seems like it's better suited for skateboarding. And so I played as Bruce Willis with a gun strapped on his back, skating <laughs> through a desert. And immediately I felt it, like I just felt that this was intuitive, that the controls matched how you would imagine skating to, to work. And uh, I, I basically signed on that day. That's amazing. And the soundtrack has been super popular. I know like the Goldfinger song is one of the top on YouTube. <laughs> um, do you credit some of that to the video game? Oh, like, absolutely, oh. yeah. I mean, it was, it was a vehicle for me at least to share the soundtrack of skateboarding because in the 80s, uh, in like mid 80s, early 90s and whatnot, it was all fueled by punk music, but it wasn't a hugely popular genre. And so I just sort of brought that along. I didn't really think that that was gonna be the, the big selling point or the big takeaway from, this, from the video game. I was more proud of the mechanics and the, and the locations and the authenticity. But at the same time, it was cool to be able to to show people what the music we were listening to, like literally to have a Dead Kennedys track on the first game, to me was the end all. Was, you know, and I, I couldn't believe that that I got to to um, share that and, and that it was so well received. So, what what advice do you have for marketers that are looking at other elements of their products, like the soundtrack and the style? Like, how do you make it authentic and? Popular. Well, I think that it's for us. It's just um, being in the in the mix and and having grown up in this skateboarding and street culture and, and, and truly knowing what is authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's just more that you can't learn that going to marketing school. You just have to live in that industry or in that world. And, and we all grew up in that in that world. So um, to us, it's more innate. What what is cool? What is what yeah, is authentic? I mean, if you were to we we kind of like to look at brands kind of on a on an x y axis right so like the vertical axis is um, the functional category so take Jeep for example like if you overlay Jeep they're in the they make SUVs right that's their vertical sort of category functional category across like horizontally is sort of that cultural continuum right and the reason why Jeep is such a strong brand is because it mean, they mean more than their functional category, right? So if you go across, there's, you call it culture. I mean, culture is just a fancy word for the things we all care about. <laughs> um, people don't have deep, deep feelings for SUVs, but they have deep, deep feelings about community. So like universally in a Jeep, you 
there's the Jeep wave, right? You see someone driving a Jeep. Um, skateboarding, you could take skateboarding as a brand and overlay it over that XY um, axis, right? So functionally, there are tricks, right, that you can iterate upon um, and the fundamentals. But when you go across, you know, Tony's talking about uh, music and he's brought that you know, and pull that together in skateboarding, which is, you know, a lot, ha has a lot to do with his success as in his own brand and his own ventures. But there's music. In, in terms of community, if you overlay skateboarding as a brand on that, um, the equivalent to the Jeep Wave is banging your trucks uh, on the coping when a kid you don't even know pulled a great trick. That can happen in Berlin, at a skate park in Berlin, and it can happen in Rio de Janeiro or here in Detroit. It's the same common language. Um, and that's how brands become meaningful. And that's, you know, that's, I guess that would be lesson number one for, uh, for marketers is, is to mean something more than your functional category. And um, we draw a lot of lessons from that, um, from skateboarding. I would say lesson two is um, inclusiveness. I mean, you've got a 51-year-old here who remains one of the greatest skateboarders in the world. And, of 46 and whatever you are, who also remain one of some of the worst skateboarders in the world. Are you hiding your um, age? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that there's, there's staying power, there's inc inclusivity, but it's, uh, yeah, I just, that's, that, to me, that's the biggest parallel is, is, is having that lateral um, meaning. You know, there's design, there's art, there's music. Um, you know, it's not just about the act of skateboarding. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of brands that try to be cool. You know, maybe they don't skateboard, but they try to integrate that into their culture. Um, why do you think they go wrong there? Is it just because they don't have the background and understand the culture? Uh, yeah, or they're just not hiring a good consultant. <laughs> I think uh, there's the plug. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the truth, though. I mean, I, I and and I had to like I did a lot of when with the success of the video game, I got some pretty big opportunities <clears throat> to. Uh, to do big sponsorships and endorsements. And I had to fight for final approval and for, for the most part, art direction in those, in those instances because they didn't want to hear from some scrappy skater that this is, you can't do it that way. That's not cool. Um, I think the, like, the best example was I was working with Frito-Lay and they wanted to do some packaging and they were taking skate photos and they were turning them so that they worked with the you know, the logistics of the package. And, and I said, well, you can't turn that trick w upside down. That doesn't, that's not skateboarding. They're like, well, you don't know, you know, you don't know our world. I said, that's fine, but I know skateboarding and you're going to get panned by a whole generation that understands skateboarding now. Yeah. Um, or uh, they would take a photo of me and, and flop it because they liked the way the direction was. And I said, you can't make me a regular footer. That doesn't work for, yeah. for me. Um, and th just those small instances where, were ones that I, I truly had to fight for. Like I, I had to stand my ground. Like no, I, that is not approved. That's not going out like that. Um, and eventually, I guess won those battles. But but also through that, w were proven to have that authenticity. Mm -hmm. I've seen surf videos where someone's going left, and then the next pan they're going right on the same sa same type of thing. Yeah, all that stuff. You know, it, it, it it's flashy, and um, it might have it might have gone well for a group when no one really understood yeah. these sports, but we're way beyond that now, and people are very savvy to these things. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the product endorsements you've done. I know you got some flack in the past for doing endorsements outside of the skateboarding industry, like in the early days, in the 80s. What was that like? <laughs> uh, well, I, I made plenty of mistakes in the 80s. Um, luckily, we didn't have social media back then. Um, or YouTube, and uh, uh, I think I just learned. I, I learned to to be more authentic with with what I was doing, and to like that fight for control. Um, in the '80s, like it was Wild West, and it was just kind of like, yeah, sure, what this, of course, yeah, you know, and and didn't really care how it was presented. Just there was just a paycheck at the end. Um, I think that uh, probably where I I got the most flack after, after that run of success, if you call it that, was doing the Bagel Bites uh, endorsement in 98, 97. And that was the first time that people saw, saw a, um, a big commercialized version of something using skateboarding. Mm -hmm. 
because they were they had huge marketing dollars and and I mean what I what I did and how I did it I I, I presented it as very authentic, um, but it didn't matter it didn't matter how cool it was it presented people were just like you're a sellout. <laughs> Tell us more about like why did Bagel your peers boy. call you a sellout? <laughs> <laughs> Bagel, Bagel boy. boy. Is it because they yeah. thought like you would not actually eat the product and you're? Uh, it something? was just it, it, skating. Skating had had been around for so long and people coveted it as this very pure hardcore activity and and they identified themselves with it and it was kind of like this cool club that you were in and so to have anyone outside of that coming in and marketing was unheard of. And, and in a lot of ways, people thought that was taboo. I was never against it. I mean, had Bagel Bites knocked on my door when I was 14, I would have done it. Um, and, it was, and, and it was something that I, I wasn't changing my value system. Like, I, I definitely still, <laughs> I still eat Bagel Bites. <clears throat> and they don't pay me. Um, but, uh, but so it wasn't, it wasn't something that was so outrageous to me. I, w I was never trying to keep I was never trying to keep skateboarding as this coveted thing that only cool people can do and outsiders are not welcome. I always wondered why it was, didn't resonate more with kids. I wondered why, like, it seems that it's the kind of thing kids would want to do. It's super cool, it's, it's daredevil, it's, it's freeing, it's low cost of entry. And so um, I wanted to promote it as best I can. And Bagel Bites actually, in my, my mindset was I'm using their marketing dollars to promote skateboarding on a bigger scale. Like I'm showing skateboarding at its best here in a commercial that's going to be seen by people who have never seen skateboarding in their, in their life. And this might be their entry point to it. Um, so I had a much different view of it and, and I, had, I had survived or suffered through all the flack of the 80s that I, was, <laughs> I had resolve when this came through and, and people were, from, you know, a, lack of a better term, talking shit about me. <laughs> where I was like, I'm, I'm still doing this, you know? I'm, I'm doing it, I'm not doing it for any different reason. Um, and I think that having pushed through that set me up um, in a good way, especially for these days, for the online hate that comes through. <laughs> right, so you you're know? very active on social media, yeah. Twitter, other channels. Um, are there haters on there ever? How do you deal with them? Please. I mean, <laughs> I know, personally, but for you, I mean, um, what's that like? Yes, very much so. Uh, but like I said, I think I think between between being an outcast in school for being a skater, between uh, pushing through the the hate of being called a sellout, like through Bagel Bites or through having video games, that that hardened me for what was to come in social media. And so when people hide anonymously and they say mean things about you, I'm just like, please, they used to say that to my face. <coughs> When I was little, or they used to they used to say things about my skating, um, and how I uh, what was the word they used? Well, they they used to say that I cheated in my skating because I would ollie into my errors because no one was doing it that way at the time, um, which I thought was awesome because mm -hmm. yeah, I could grab my board however I wanted to because it was already in the air, mm -hmm. and that that was very much against the grain of skating. And so I used to get panned, literally in Thrasher magazine for winning an event. Cause like it was you're like, cheating or something? Yeah, I was like, oh, Tony Hawk just ollies around and grabs his board wherever. Like, what's the point? <laughs> now everyone does it. It's really the only way you can get air. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, it was, for me, it was, it was more a, a function, it was more functionality because I was so small. I didn't have the bulk or the strength to get in the air by muscling it through. It was more like I had to do it that way. Mm -hmm. So when you look back at your career, you're still a professional skateboarder, still compete. Um, how did you bring all this other stuff into your life, like endorsements, video games? Was that, did you seek for other avenues to um, expand your career or how did that Yes happen? and no, if I felt like there was a void in, in the industry or if there was an opportunity to expand skateboarding, um, through a, a different type of promotion than I was willing to do it. I, I don't know, I, it's more, I take it case by case. It's, it's whatever I think is, is something that is, would resonate, that, that does fit, um, or if it's something I believe in. And um, I don't really have some, some overall criteria that like, okay, this, this will work, this will work. And uh, 
I, and, and also just more like, I gotta walk the walk. I mean, that's, that's truly what it's about for me is, is I'm still skating. Yeah, I'm, I'm way older than most skaters, most pros, um, most people. Uh, <laughs> but, but I'm still able to do it and I feel like I'm still relevant in that I'm, I'm doing, I'm, I'm progressing. Um, I'm not. I'm not trying to do the biggest spins. I'm not doing the big ramps and stuff. But I do have a, a creative. Um, I, I have a a creative force that's still in me that that I still really enjoy, and that's why I'm able to, or that I can justify doing these bigger promotions. Mm -hmm. Looking on YouTube, we're at Google here. Um, your most popular <laughs> video when I search for Tony Hawk on YouTube is the spiral loop going into yeah. your, your half pipe. That is um, odd. Yeah, why yeah. do you think that's the most popular? I don't video? know. I, I think maybe it's it's easier to understand from a non skating perspective, um, because some you know skate tricks are very technical. Some people don't understand why this one could be that much harder than more that visual. one. It's more visual, and there are plenty of crashes. I, I know the value of showing your <laughs> your painful attempts as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I don't know. That one just that one's the gift that keeps on giving. Like it just comes around every once in a while, and suddenly it gets millions more views. But um, I'm proud of it. I mean, it was it was definitely as hard as it looked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looked hard. I'd never yeah. want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> um, some of the other popular ones are when you rode a hoverboard, and it was like trick photography. There were wires, oh boy. and you got some flack for that. I thought, um, we, got, I thought we got past that. <laughs> I know there's interest in what's the story there. Like the, vi <laughs> the video said, this is not a joke. This is real. Yeah. And then you got some pushback. <laughs> so first of all, that was not my idea. Um, it w it came from Funny or Die. It wasn't ours either. <clears throat> for the record. <laughs> yeah. If these guys had been around, we would have marketed it much better. Um, <laughs> Thank you. No. Uh, so they came to me. Funny or Die came to me and said, we have the rig that they use for Back to the Future for the hoverboards, do you want to come be a part of it? And I was like, that sounds awesome. And it came from Funny or Die. So clearly, in my eyes, this is going to be a comedy segment. And, and they had, um, what's his name? Doc, sorry, his name escapes me. Yeah, Christopher Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd oh. come, come to the set, and I was like, oh, this is insane. Like, this is one of the coolest things I've ever done. And they loved the edit so much that they presented it as being real. <clears throat> and then went dark. They, like the, the, the guys who made it just went silent. So I was the one to answer for it. And then people were just angry with me. Like, I don't think this is real. Why are you, why are you lying to us? Right. And, and right. it really, like, the that's the point where... shown through there. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> the inauthenticity shown through, right, people? See, I'm sorry yeah, it was, it was exactly not authentic. Um, so uh, I actually had to make a video of me sort of pleading with people like, I'm sorry, this was, this was a joke. Mm -hmm. I thought it was supposed to be presented as a joke. We're not trying to fool you. It was more fun. And yeah, they're not real. I wish they were real. I thought it was real at first. <laughs> <laughs> real. <laughs> um, the funny thing is, right around that time, it was only just a few months later that um, someone said, these, this group um, in Palo Alto was like, hey, we actually made a hoverboard. Do you want to come try it? Oh yeah, the Hendo one is that. Hendo, the, yeah, yeah, which was very much not like the one that people imagined. <laughs> it was like a it was centimeter. Super off clunky. Yeah. yeah, it had to go on a metal surface. Um, it had these whirling engines. It was impossible to control. You would go into, go into a death spiral immediately. Um, but it was real. <laughs> yeah. So at least we got <laughs> people. Yeah, yeah, I mean, so the timing was was very odd with that. Right. Um, are there other mistakes that you've made in terms of like, <laughs> <laughs> these are interesting, you know, like signing your na rights to your name over like early on. I think there were products that maybe you yeah. didn't believe in that um, had the Tony Hawk brand on them. Yeah, I think the biggest lesson I learned was was not to to uh, sign my name over for for approval to someone else to, to just like carte blanche. To literally sign my life away. I think the, the, the biggest lesson came when it was, it was in the mid 80s, maybe late 80s. And I, I didn't know any better. I was 19 or whatever. And, and I signed a contract with these people that they could make any product with my name on it. And they started making these super cheap Velcro wallets, um, these plastic fingerboards. And, and the, it wasn't even the products. It was more the logos were just so cheap. And they were kind of ripoffs of other escape brands. And I was like, you guys, 
I, I finally went up there and I said, you guys can't do it this. And they said, actually, we can. <laughs> and, uh, and as this guy's talking, I'll never forget, as the guy's talking to me, there, he has all these products behind him on his, on his shelves. And there's a roll of toilet paper that says Tony Hawk gear. And, I, and it keeps catching my, kept, toilet it, paper. it was catching my eye as he's talking. And I go, what, what is that? And he said, oh, that was one of our um, retailers said, uh, you know, we we're making all the stuff. And they said, you could put Tony Hawk's name on anything, even toilet paper, and it would sell. And he's like, so we made that for him as a joke. As a joke. Yeah. And, 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 and to sell. him, that was amazing. And that was, he was complimenting me. And to me, I was like, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> this is like, this is my worst nightmare. And I actually had to pay to get out of that contract. Oh, wow. Like, that was the last time I saw them. Um, I, I said, I don't want to work with you guys anymore. And they said, well, it's, it's going to cost you because they, they, tried to, they tried to charge me for the molds for their, um, their fingerboards, their, the, what now is considered tech deck, but they made these little plastic molds as if they weren't going to make those anyway, oh, okay. as if other companies weren't making the, the same thing. Mm -hmm. They said, well, like, I have to pay for this giant machine that makes those products. I was like, that doesn't work, no. <laughs> Um, question for Ryan here. Um, you, you see Tony from the outside. You know him. Um, how do you think he's maintained his personal brand relevancy over as a 51-year-old skateboarder? Oh, my goodness. I mean, Tony, come on. Because he's, he's still, uh, well, first of all, he's still performing at a level of a 22-year-old when he's 50-something. Uh, you know, he's constantly kind of reinventing himself. He's constantly staying relevant. He's communicating. He's unbelievable with uh, how he handles social media it is, is great. We're constantly kind of learning from that. So there's kind of this just, uh, uh, he just has a good, well-rounded personality that uh, is, is pretty multifaceted that I think is great, where there's the, there's the intensity and the competitive side of him that people relate to, but then there's also the, um, you know, he's, he's very um, charitable in nature and stuff and constantly showing off and uh, showing others accomplishments and things like that. I think there's just a really relatable person that, uh, you know, relates to many age levels, many different, uh, you know, interest levels and stuff like that. So he's constantly kind of uh, doing new things and being progressive. Yeah. You, you mentioned the charity, like there's the Tony Hawk Foundation, which is amazing. Do you want to say, put in a plug for like some of the work you've done there? I think it's uh, incredible. Sure, yeah. I th well, we act as a resource center for um, groups that want to get skate parks in the area. And uh, at some point we realized that our funding, even though it's not a lot, it goes a long way to help people finally get a, a park approved or to get matching donations and things. And so we started uh, 18 years ago. We've helped to fund over 900 skate parks now. Um, we've given away I think over $8 million. Um, and we are partnering up with other groups, including Ralph C. Wilson Foundation, uh, to focus on areas in Michigan. Um, so a lot of the parks that are around here, we've had a hand in because of that, that grant. Um, and I mean, it's the work I'm most proud of. And selfishly, I just get more places to skate. Yeah, I keep it up. <laughs> I love skating too. So I'm hitting up <laughs> yeah, all the these Ann Arbor Park. Yeah, yeah, I love and then, the Ann Arbor uh, The skate one here, park. the Riverside, uh, the Ride at Sculpture Park, and Hamtramck, um, Ferndale. Those are all parks that we help to uh, facilitate. Right, they're beautiful spots. So. Thank you. Um, what about one more word about decal? Like, tell us, what does this agency mean to you? Like. Uh, it's exciting to be on the other side of, of the, the marketing game, so to speak, because I feel like I was, I was working with companies that, that it wasn't the most positive interaction or the most positive experience. Um, and, and there was a lot of fighting to, to, to keep this authenticity of this world that I grew up loving and that I want to represent well. And so to be on the other side of that, I feel like we are giving an opportunity to, to brands to have a good experience and for, to actually listen to, to what we have to say instead of having it a battle. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and I, like the, the first campaign we did was bringing back Bagel Bites, mm -hmm. um, which I thought was super cool because it was, uh, we, we got to acknowledge that the first time around was, was tricky with being called a sellout and whatnot, but also in a fun way. And I don't know if anyone saw it, but we, you know, we, we brought it back around where, um, I'm an adult now and still, still uh, living through the, the echoes of 
having been called a sellout. Um, and, and as we're doing it, this interview, you realize that the interview is actually just a big Bagel Mites commercial. Um, <laughs> I did it see up. it. It's a good, it's a yeah. good one. Yeah, it's really It funny. was almost like therapy. <laughs> it was, yeah. But that was, that was um, these guys brought that to them, the idea. And uh, I went along for the ride, and I loved it. I'm really proud of it. So I think that that, that was a good example of, of what we're doing, where we're actually acknowledging what we're doing, but still doing it in a cool way. It is funny that um, it, when we go talk to prospective clients, there's often a question, you know, because Tony can't go to all of these things. And, um, you know, there's the excitement and all that. And then there's the, so Tony's role, <laughs> you know, and, you know, and, but it's, it leads, it leads directly into probably one of the biggest differences. And, and it, and it does blend into this whole conversation we've been having is just that outsider mentality. Um, you know, 80% of the people that are affiliated with our shop have never worked at an agency ever. And, um, and Tony is an integral part of that. Um, quite frankly, he's introduced us to people that probably wouldn't have returned our phone calls. Um, you know, Atiba Jefferson is one of them. Like this, you, you wouldn't know his name, but you know, when LeBron James went to the Lakers, he's like, where's Atiba? He takes my photos. You know, like he's a very accomplished photographer, came from skateboarding, uh, street culture. You know, he's just one of these really interesting people who just intrinsically understand brands um, and understand brands and th their place in the world. And um, we're the, you know, we're the ones that know all the acronyms, you know, and know how to interface with clients and, and kind of translate that. And so um, that's, I mean, we couldn't, we couldn't have created a different sort of model, um, you know, had Tony not uh, decided to be a part of this. So it's, it's, we're very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That's awesome. Um, we want to have some Q&A uh, from the audience. All right. What's going on, Tony? Hi. Uh, Southern California, thanks for uh, wearing out my GameCube with uh, Underground <laughs> 2 and American Wasteland. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so just with, like, just in looking at, like, the future of skating, uh, I know with, like, the 2020 Olympics, with skating being in there, like, what do you see for the future of skating? Um, I, I just see it being an activity that kids choose as readily as they choose to play basketball or baseball or, you know, all, or soccer across the world. I think that the Olympics will be a boost for the international awareness of skating. Um, I think that kids will probably be inspired to try it in places where it maybe wasn't available to them before. Um, but in terms of that aspect with the Olympics, I've always said I, I truly feel that at this point, the summer games need the cool factor of skateboarding more than skateboarding needs their validation. Um, and, and I stand by that, and people that, that rubs some people the wrong way, especially the IOC. Um, but, but I do feel that way because they, they got the cool factor with snowboarding in the winter games and summer games. Like, how many more swimming events can we have? Um, that's how I feel. <laughs> And it's gonna, you know, it's gonna resonate with kids. Finally, they're gonna get a younger uh, viewership, um, and it's gonna be, it's what a cool opportunity for the the kids that grew up skating as, as outcasts, as as people who were told not to skate on public property, who are told like skateboarding is not a career, um, it, it's not just a crime, it's not a career, and uh, and that suddenly they're gonna be on this huge stage and they're gonna be revered for their skills. I think it's awesome. Hi, thank you guys for uh, spending some time with us on this Friday. Uh, love the story about the toilet paper branding and trying to figure out a way to make that <laughs> We're cool. bringing it back. <laughs> well, I was going to say. We got plans. Uh, so, right, uh, Adam over here, I know, uh, was able to, uh, when he was at Organic, was able to uh, help make the you, you by Kotex brand pretty awesome <laughs> and cool. So, so he, basically breathing life and breathing an identity into a feminine care product is uh, a, a great start. But I was going to say, uh, what was cool to me about that campaign, give, giving teenage girls a voice and a platform to express themselves, your skating you know, and, and brand and style and, and the music for me as a teenager was kind of speaking to me in this um, you know, independence level, giving me a platform to actually separate myself from, you know, forge my own identity. Uh, what advice would you guys have for Google as a big brand, ubiquitous, uh, not a new brand anymore. How can we kind of avoid falling into the trap of being this monolithic, uh, you know, faceless kind of uh, entity in the future and, and still maintain a cool brand? Return our emails. <laughs> <laughs> Clean up your homepage. The New York, the New York office. Stop tracking, <laughs> stop tracking my whereabouts. No. 
Um, uh, no, I think, well, I, I, Google has, has great opportunity to, um, to help uh, highlight um, new ideas, new sports, new, I mean, like skateboarding is so inclusive now. Uh, like in, in the Olympics, there will be uh, equal disciplines, male and female, equal, uh, nowadays with the, the competitions, there's equal prize money. And I think to be able to really lift that idea up um, is something that Google would, is fully capable of. And to highlight and to celebrate, um, I mean, that's just one small part, but I think it's just more diving in and realizing what, what can you do as a force of good and what can you uh, promote that is something that is maybe not, is underappreciated. That's my sort of vague answer. I, I don't really, I didn't think I'd be marketing for Google, so. Um, <laughs> and some free advice here. What's that? Yeah, I, don't, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan, so. Google, uh, here's, here's how our lives have intersected. I was on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire Celebrity Edition, I think in 2002, um, maybe 2001, 2002, and my brother was my lifeline to call for advice. Um, it was a charity of, uh, episode, so any money you won goes to your charity, and that was the year I started Tony Hawk Foundation. Um, and uh, I got to the $125,000 question, and I called my brother because he uh, is a literature major, and it was, a, it was a, a quote about Hemingway, and he had been practicing using Google uh, as a lifeline, um, which was kind of unheard of at that time. You know, people were not really like, I know in later episodes, people would call up, okay, Google this. Um, but at that time, he was actually experimenting with Yahoo and with Google, and he found that Google was the one that had the, the most correct answers. Yes, you can applaud yourselves. Um, <laughs> and so, but the funny thing is, I called him because it was a literature question, and he's a literature major, and as I'm asking him the question, I hear him typing, I'm like, oh, shit. He doesn't know it. And immediately, he was like, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, what is it, uh, sorry, what's the book? Mark, it was, uh, anyway, the thing was about Mark Twain. He said, like, what's Mark Twain? Yeah, it's Mark Twain. That's it, for sure. Because every hit, like the top five answers were that. Um, and so Google, thanks to Google, we got $125,000 for the Tony Hawk Foundation. That was the very first seed money for the foundation. That was literally the first donation to Tony Hawk Foundation, so thank you for that. Yeah. Sorry, it was a long, long way to get there, but. <clears throat> I mean, you guys have, you guys have achieved um, what a lot of brands want to achieve, and that is, you know, for your brand to be a verb. I mean, that's, that's you got that. <laughs> All right, hi, Tony. So people probably think at this stage in your life that your body is pretty much invincible. So um, you pretty much have pissed <laughs> off you your body. <laughs> so. Day to day, what constantly hurts? My neck. My neck. Yeah, that's, that's the one thing that I do get worked on because of all the sort of whiplash through my life. Um, I definitely, like, it, I, I'm that guy that, that when someone calls over here and I go like, like huh, what? And then, and then, yeah, and then they're like, I look like an old man when I do it. And they're like, something wrong with your neck? I'm like, yes. <laughs> For decades, there was something wrong with my neck. Yeah, because mine are my ankles, and I just skated for like you know ten years, and that was it. So I can't imagine doing it like yeah, as long as you have. The irony is that is that I continued to skate big ramps, which, believe it or not, are a little bit safer because you're not you don't have that giant impact. Like you have this big gradient to go down and land, and I know how to fall in that in that realm. I can't run out of like jumping down eight stairs. That's just not, that's not what I'm doing anymore, and my body can't deal with that. That's a true fact, because my, my garage is, is a mini ramp. It's all, and it, it's deadly. <laughs> yeah, the smaller stuff I fall, is, is where- I immediately it, hit the flat. One mistake is, is you, can't, you can't sort of just fall downward, like down the hill. It's His more ramp like, is like the Grand everything Canyon. is right there. And yeah. it's like giant slides that you can slide down. But, it's, but yeah. I do get shins like that from I mean, that's just from, yeah, that's 40 years of, of trying to avoid my skateboard in that area. It didn't work. 
Hi guys, thanks so much for being here, back in the back. Yeah. Um, I wanna talk about the agency a little bit. Most of us in this room uh, got our start on the creative agency or the agency side. And I'm curious to know, we know how much, how many hours and what kind of hustle it takes to make an agency grow. Curious to know how you guys are gonna future-proof or bulletproof your agency here in Detroit, given some of the challenges we have with the strike and automotive and how you plan to help grow our community as well. If so. Yeah, that's a good question. The, do, do the bags under my eyes and his eyes give it away? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, one, one would ask themselves, why would you start a, an agency now, right? Like, you know, Gary Graff's agency, just one of the greatest, just closed its doors. Um, you've got in-housing happening, right? I think it's like to the tune of 75% now of brands in-housing. When I left advertising for a little while and uh, ran brand marketing at Carhartt. We were in housing, uh, but not all of it. So I know the trials and tribulations there of creating too much of a bubble. Um, and ask Pepsi. I don't know if anyone knows that joke, right? They, they're in-house agency. They went all in-house. The very first thing they put out. Yeah, let's not relive that. Um, yeah, so to future proof, it's really, uh, it's really about being um, as nimble. And I know that sounds like such a cliche, but the way we've set this thing up is um, we go in with the same two or three people every time to figure out what exactly, let's triangulate the issue um, instead of service selling. Um, you know, we are an industry that loves to hate itself, right? Like, I mean, it's true. Um, we're really good at that. Uh, and so, you know, that was part of the reason why we wanted to bring, you know, mostly outsiders that don't have the bad habits to kind of keep us honest um, and uh, approach things a little differently, approach things kind of how skateboarders do. You know, seeing, uh, you know, seeing a loading dock, a skateboarder sees a skate park. Um, so that's, I would say that would be one of the biggest sort of differentiators is the outside or uh, the outside or being comprised of mostly outsiders. Um, you know, and I, and I think the other thing is being um, adaptable. So, you know, we can deliver, you know, our deliverables, if we're going to use some of these terms, um, are very different depending on the client. There's some clients, we're just, we're giving them one cheaters to their in-house. I mean, we're like their in-house agency's favorite agency because we're bringing them concepts they wouldn't have thought of that they can go execute. Um, you know, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's setting ourselves up to not go in with like this army of hungry mouths. Um, Right, we're, we're, yeah. we're trying to be nimble. Use that microphone. <laughs> we're trying to be nimble and we're trying to be networked, right? We don't have this massive army, but we do have a big network of original thinkers from all over the country. And we're trying to bring a lot of that creativity to, to, to uh, businesses in Detroit, but also businesses everywhere else. We're working uh, with the big auto companies, but we're also trying to help people with, uh, you know, small business incubators and Flint, you know, trying to come up with new solutions and stuff. So. Um, we like tackling uh, all kinds of problems, big and small, and we just come at it from different ways with different uh, outside thinking. And that, and that network, um, I mean, with Tony involved, helps. I mean, you know, there's been times where, you know, can we, can we run something by Spike Jones, you know? Like, and Tony can help us do that, right? Um, and then having these, this advisory board, I mentioned one of them, and I won't go through all of them, but um, they're all on our website. Um, decalagency.com, um, you know, they, they, they all have interesting connections. So this, this network is very real, uh, not to mention this creator network we're building. You know, it's not, I wouldn't call it, um, I wouldn't call it crowdsourcing. It's much more curated, but there's a, there's a world of creative people out there. I mean, we have people on this roster that are, you know, everything from a, a poet to ceramicist to street artists. Um, and we've kind of reimagined the creative process. Uh, they don't know how to look at a creative brief like we do, right? Like they don't know what to do with technographic data and demographic data and all of that stuff. We've kind of reimagined it with very simple pictograph briefs and 80% of the stuff we get back from them is garbage. But when you put it on the wall, it kind of feels like cheating because it's like the engine's warm and you can start making correlations and seeing and clustering things. And it's just, a, it's a fun way to work. Um, I don't know, hopefully that answers your question. It's also embracing how the, the speed of change now, like when I was doing the, the original Bag of Ice promotions, th those were two to three year deals. Nowadays, people want to promote stuff and they want it 
quick and they want it out on social media and it's like a three to six month uh, cycle and, and to embrace that and to enjoy that is something because everyone's trying to hang on to it much longer um, and, and to be impactful in that, in that short time period is something that we're very used to. Hey, Tony, and two guys with Tony. How's it going? <laughs> Who are those two dudes sitting next to Tony? I'm Rachel, and before, like two years ago, I had no idea about skateboarding or knowledge around skateboarding. I just knew like Avril Lavigne skateboarder songs, so that was my knowledge. <laughs> and I met my boyfriend who is deeply rooted in skateboarding and has brought me into this community and culture that I didn't even know about. And I and advertising was way off because that was my perception. And um, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but his friend group is actually the friend group that was in Minding the Gap, the movie on oh, Hulu. Sure, yeah. And we, uh, we sponsor uh, Kier. Oh, who, nice, uh, Kier. It was, I don't know if anyone saw Minding the Gap, but um, Kier is one of the, one of the featured uh, subjects. And we sponsor him on Birdhouse now. Awesome. That's great to hear. Kier's really cool. That's what I hear. I haven't met him yet. Um, yeah, he's Jordan cool. loves him and Bing. Um, and so it's been so cool getting a, you know, a peep into this community and everybody should watch that movie because I think it just like really speaks to culture and the guys and what they're able to do. But obviously behind it being cool and Jordan is way cooler than me and very authentic in his style. But there's this deep rooted background to these guys and coming to the skate park and being an outlet. So I'm just curious, like, is this something you're passionate about, something that you're willing to take a stand for than just, you know, the authenticity and cool and going to these different competitions? Um, well, in terms of just trying to promote skateboarding on a bigger scale, I, I tell people that it, it did wonders for my self-confidence at a time when I was a nerdy kid and I didn't really fit in. I, I played baseball and basketball and I was okay at best. You know, I didn't stand out, but also I didn't like that I had to go to this regimented schedule and I had to listen to the coach and the team was relying on my performance and I was relying on their performance. I mean, I don't want to knock teamwork, but it just didn't speak to me. And I found skateboarding and I found this, this collection of people that didn't fit in anywhere else, but were supportive. Um, and I learned to solve problems. I mean, that, that's the bottom line. Like if I came up with a small challenge for myself, it was problem solving and I figured it out and, and it did wonders for believing in myself. Um, and that's what I want to promote for skateboarding. And that's what is truly the heart of it and what I believe in. You know, it's, it's, if I could add to that, um, you know, grow, growing up, you know, I was a, I'm not just saying this. I was a Tony Hawk fan. You were a Christian Hosoi fan, right? Mark Gonzalez. Okay, Gonzalez. Oh, okay. Um, and Tony Hawk. And Tony. Um, but, you know, they, they were these mythological people who lived in a faraway land, and we were here in Michigan. Like, there was no internet. Like, you circled the box to order your stuff, and you waited six weeks for it to come. And it was like, oh, my God, they're really for real. You know, or you traded the videos and all of that. Now we can see what he, he ate last night um, on Instagram. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is, I didn't realize at the time how much I was learning about creativity and iteration and all that. Like, it wasn't being taught in school. It wasn't being taught in sports where you sort of, you needed to know how to throw a ball or catch to, as a point of entry. Um, it was learning iteration. I mean, before you could even tail stall, you had to learn how to rock to fakie, and you know, you'll probably know some of these terms at some point. But um, like building on those things and and connecting dots like it was it it just came naturally and um and really f problem solving um you know and and i think if i could speak for for you tony like early in his career like he was a creative like he didn't he wasn't a agency creative he was a creative like he learned how to edit and animate and you know all the things you need to do to market you know within an industry that wasn't doing very well because people like me went to college and forgot about it for a little bit. Um, I, was, I was doing those things more out of desperation because I couldn't afford to have someone else do them for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I learned how to edit videos just because I had to. And the point, point is, is it's, uh, you know, kids don't even realize it right now. Like the young, you know, young kids, they're learning about iteration and how to connect dots and um, how to add style to something that, you know, there is a fundament, fundamental way to do it, but you can do it your way. And uh, that's just something that, you know, they're not getting at school. And, and not to knock team sports, you don't really, 
there's a certain way you have to do it. So. Very well, Tony, Ryan, and Adam, thank you so much for coming to Google. We're thank all you. huge fans. Thank you. thank you. Round of applause for these guys.